Ever wondered why your heart races when you're scared? Or why you suddenly feel calm after the danger is gone? That's your autonomic nervous system at work. The sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, constantly keeping your body in balance. In this video, we're breaking it all down. How these two systems work, what makes them different, and why they're so important for your health. Let's dive in. So, the nervous system basically has two main parts. The CNS, or central nervous system, and the PNS, or peripheral nervous system. I'll break down the CNS in a separate video, but in this one, we're focusing on the PNS. Think of the peripheral nervous system as a communication bridge between your brain and spinal cord and the rest of your body. It makes sure everything stays under proper control. The PNS itself is divided into two parts, the somatic system and the autonomic system. Now, the autonomic system is the part that runs in the background. It works automatically without you having to think about it, and it keeps your internal organs in check. It's further divided into two branches the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. You can picture these two like the two sides of a scale. They usually work in opposite ways, but together they keep your body balanced and ready for whatever's going on. I'll dive into more details about each in a moment. Here's a quick example. When your sympathetic system kicks in, your body goes into fight or flight mode. Think of that feeling when a dog suddenly starts chasing you, or when you're freaking out right before an important exam. On the flip side, when the parasympathetic system is active, your body switches to rest and digest mode. That's the chill, sleepy vibe you get when you're lying on the couch after a huge dinner, feeling totally relaxed. It's the balance between these two systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic, that keeps your body working smoothly no matter what life throws at you. So, what exactly happens to the body when these systems kick in? Let's start with the sympathetic system the one that gets you ready for fight or flight. Imagine someone just stole your food and is now sprinting away at full speed. What does their body need to do in that moment? Pupils dilate so they can see better and quickly find an escape route. The heart starts pounding faster to pump enough blood to all the muscles. Digestion basically shuts down because this is not the time to digest lunch, it's time to save your life first. The bladder relaxes because let's be honest, no one has time for a bathroom break while running for their life. Salivary and other secretory glands pause to conserve water. You're not gonna be sipping tea mid-chase anyway. Blood vessels in the muscles widen to deliver more blood and oxygen to those working muscles. The lungs open up more so you can take in a larger amount of air and get plenty of oxygen. See how everything makes perfect sense? The body is literally shifting all its resources to give you the best shot at survival. All right, now let's look at the parasympathetic system. Picture our food thief again. They finally found a safe spot, no danger in sight, and now it's time to relax and enjoy the meal. Pupils shrink back to normal size since there's no need for wide open danger vision anymore. The heart slows down because there's no reason to pump blood like crazy now. Digestion turns back on, getting ready to break down and absorb food. Salivary glands start producing saliva again, making eating smoother and easier. The lungs go back to their normal size since deep, fast breathing is no longer needed. The bladder contracts, so now's finally a good time for a bathroom break. Blood vessels in the muscles constrict, redirecting blood to places like the digestive system so the food can be processed and nutrients absorbed. See how this system basically does the opposite of the sympathetic system? And that's exactly the point. Both systems are essential for survival and health. The most important thing is keeping them in balance so your body can respond properly to whatever situation you're in. Before we go any further, it's good to know where each of these nerves actually starts. The sympathetic nerves come out of the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. After they leave, they synapse with a second set of nerves, and it's this second nerve that finally reaches the target organs. And what are those target organs? They include the pupils of the eyes, the heart, the lungs, the digestive system, like the stomach, liver, and intestines, the adrenal glands, and the bladder. Now let's switch over to the parasympathetic system. Parasympathetic nerves start from the brain and the sacral region, 
and travel as long preganglionic nerves. These then synapse with shorter postganglionic nerves, which finally connect to the target organs. And which organs do they reach? Well, pretty much the exact same ones as the sympathetic system. Which makes sense, because these two systems have to stay coordinated, like two sides of a scale. You might be wondering, how is it possible that both the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems connect to the same organs, yet their effects are completely different? Here's a simple way to think about it. Imagine you need to get to a specific destination. There are many ways to get there. You could take a plane or drive a car. In the end, you reach the same destination, but the experience is totally different. One way is fast, another is slow, one feels relaxing, another exhausting. It's the same in the body. The sympathetic and parasympathetic systems might act on the same organ, like the heart or the intestines, but because they use different signaling pathways, the end result is different. In neuroscience, these signaling pathways are divided into three main categories, cholinergic, adrenergic, dopaminergic. So the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic function isn't just about which organ they target, it's also about the neurotransmitters and receptors they use. That's why sometimes your heart rate increases and other times it slows down, or why sometimes your gut activity is suppressed and other times it ramps up. Let's break this down step by step, starting with the cholinergic pathway in the parasympathetic system. The neuron you see here is a preganglionic parasympathetic neuron. It originates in the central nervous system either in the brain or the sacral region of the spinal cord, and its axon extends all the way to a point near the target organ. But it doesn't work alone. Near the target, it forms a synapse with another neuron called the postganglionic neuron. And finally, this postganglionic neuron reaches the target organ and delivers its signal, completing the pathway. Now, how does the signal actually get from the preganglionic neuron to the postganglionic neuron? This is where the cholinergic system comes in for the first time. The preganglionic neuron releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, ACH. This ACH binds to nicotinic receptors on the postganglionic neuron and activates them. These receptors are linked to ion channels. When ACH binds, the channel opens, sodium flows into the neuron, potassium flows out, and the result is depolarization of the postganglionic neuron. This depolarization is basically the green light for the signal to continue. The postganglionic neuron now carries the message all the way to the target organ. At the target organ, ACH is released again, but here it can bind to two, two types of receptors, nicotinic receptors, which again open ion channels and directly depolarize the target, muscarinic receptors, which work differently. They activate G proteins that trigger a cascade of second messengers inside the cell, leading to more complex metabolic effects. And that's how the parasympathetic system carefully transmits its signal, step by step, all the way from the brain or spinal cord to the final organ. Our next neuron is a preganglionic sympathetic neuron. This neuron also originates in the CNS, but comes out of the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. Unlike the parasympathetic system, where the preganglionic neuron travels almost all the way to the target organ, here, the preganglionic sympathetic neuron synapses very early, right after leaving the spinal cord. It connects with a postganglionic neuron in a sympathetic ganglion. These ganglia are arranged like little beads running alongside the spinal cord, forming what's known as the sympathetic chain ganglia. Inside this ganglion, the preganglionic neuron releases acetylcholine again, which activates nicotinic receptors on the postganglionic neuron. This causes depolarization, and the signal continues traveling down the postganglionic neuron until it reaches the target organ. So far, this is pretty similar to what we saw in the parasympathetic system. But here's where things get interesting. Once the signal reaches the end of the postganglionic neuron, the way it communicates with the target organ can vary. It can use one of three pathways. The first pathway is the dopaminergic pathway, in which dopamine is released. The next one is the adrenergic pathway, where epinephrine or norepinephrine is secreted, also commonly referred to as adrenaline and noradrenaline. Finally, we have the cholinergic pathway, which functions similarly to the parasympathetic system by releasing acetylcholine, but that one is rare, mainly used in sweat glands.
I hope you found this video helpful. If you'd like to learn more about autonomic drugs or some of the disorders of the autonomic system, click on this video here. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel. And if you know someone who might benefit from this video, share it with them. See you in the next one.